be 15 minutes talking about yeah, awesome. uh, talking about career pivots so the whole point was to <clears throat> share my story and sort of the moves I've made uh, the last few the last minutes and with that the whole point is not to encourage you to do this but just to give you information that can also make um, books can read. Awesome. Now, this is just a photo of uh, Stanford, the Graduate School of Business. I use their slides, so, uh, the, the, the format. Okay, we'll start now. So this is me. I was I was literally where you are. Uh, so I'll tell you my story using photos. So I, 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 from med school, so I started med school in 2005 after finishing high school in Capsabed Boys. Um, I was there from 2000 to 2004, uh, when, before it became such a big deal as it is now, apparently. So I finished, I went to med school. I remember the dates, I'm, I'm a dates person. So 24th October, 2005, uh, till 3rd December, 2010, we graduated. It was a really tough five years then. I hear now it's six years, so it's a different story. I worked for the government of Kenya. And then after two and a half years, one year internship in Kericho in a town called Kapkatet. And then another one and a half years in Isiolo as an emo and uh, under the guidance of our med soup who then was Dr. Kigondu, and you know now Dr. Kigondu, who's my mentor, is, is a KMA president. And we'll talk about like mentorship and how important it is. Huh? So this was in 20... So follow the story. I hope I'm giving you the timeline. So 2011, I'm in Kapkatet, April to 2012, April. 2012, May to 2013, early October, I'm, I'm in Isiolo. And then I go to do a degree in public health. Inspired by... Inspired by this is what I saw in the health system, and I thought, oh my, we need to <clears throat> sort of come up with better solutions and better interventions for patients. But the real inspiration was also just sort of to, to play a bigger role in trying to efficiently allocate resources. So I didn't want to become a manager. I just wanted to help people sort of say, okay, this is the fixed spot that we have. How can we allocate it to the various departments and the various cost centers so that we can serve our patients better. So I'm doing a zigzag, yeah? After London school, <clears throat> I came back. I, I had resigned from government. I didn't have a job. And then I went to work in a group called CHAI. CHAI is Clinton Health Access Initiative. And you can see the parallel. So Matiko, who came in on Wednesday, he's right now in CHAI. I was there in 2015. And Matiko went to London school the year before I did. Um, and there's some certain differences which, which we can talk about. But we did health economics. And he's remained like a pure health economist while I <clears throat> ventured into other things. After Chai, for a few months, I worked in Lesotho, or people say Lesotho, in Southern Africa. Um, I was working on the healthcare financing team, and a lot of the work we were doing is just literally to sort of understand the, the money coming into the health system. Let me put it in a simple way. The money coming in, and then once we have sort of a, a, a mapping of the resources, and the country has sort of these five-year plans. You know, Kenya, we have this five-year plan. So usually, after the government launches a five-year plan, there's a team that has to cost the five-year plan, how much it costs to implement this five-year plan. So we look at the resources that we have. We look at the cost of this plan. We do a gap analysis between the resources and the costing. And then we say, this is what we'll do to fill the gap. So one of the things we are doing is to apply for the Global Fund uh, application for TB, malaria, HIV, to fill part of the gap. You know, so I did that, and then I joined Pharma. I, I, I was in Pharma for seven years. So I started in Novo Nordisk. I was privileged and fortunate to join this program called the Associate Managers Program, which was a rotational, think of it like a graduate program in the medical team. And I'm happy to share what doctors do in Pharma, but I was in the medical team. And uh, so it was three rotations, eight months each, so one, eight months in Nairobi, I came back to Kenya. This is 15 September to April 16. And then I went to, I went to uh, Dubai. That was the Africa headquarters. So I lived in Dubai for eight months and till end of 16. And then I moved to Nigeria in 2017 for another eight months. So I loved it. Like I thoroughly enjoyed my time. So December 17, I come back to Kenya. And that's the first time I'm back at home proper in like five years since 2013. Because I used to be all over the place. So I stayed committed seven years. My job was literally just initially, <clears throat> when I came back to Kenya to move to cover 
So initially, in Novonodisk, I was covering diabetes, and then I moved to, to work in growth hormone and hemophilia and obesity. I'm happy to share that as well. I'll just give you top line. We can go to Q&A by there. And then I joined J&J uh, during the pandemic. So Johnson & Johnson was bringing the COVID-19 vaccine. They were assembling a vaccine team, and they just reached out. A recruiter reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, there's this position. Are you interested? I was like, cool. I uh, went through this long interview process by time, not number. So, and, and and that's something you need to be prepared as doctors. We are never prepared for interviews. Novo, I did four interviews. Chai, I did three interviews. Jianjie, I did three interviews. Usually it's longer sometimes. And then after one year in J&J, the pandemic started going down. I decided to come back to school. So I'm at Stanford at the GSB, also known as the Graduate School of Business, doing a mid-career master's program called the MSX or the Sloan Fellows Program. And this typically targets um, people who are in the middle of their career, who are looking to either pivot to something new, to accelerate into leadership, or to move to entrepreneurship. It's like a one-year MBA, the way to think about it, but for older people, like for folks like me who, who so I'm married, I have a daughter, and, and I, like 60% of my class is married, we have kids. That's a huge difference to the MBA. MBA tends to be a bit uh, younger. So you can see I, I kept on, like I have this interesting career. At some point, I thought I'll do a PhD. And after London school, I was inspired. I was like, yeah, we'll do a PhD, save the world. I was like, nope. So so that that's another key thing you learn, as in it's important you know what you're good at and what you're not good at. I thought I should start by sharing. I, I hope I think I can hide this. Yeah? I thought I should start by sharing um, some of the initial days in Kenyatta, in, in med school. And I'm sure these places are still there. So this is LT3. And LT3 was pivotal in our life, as you all imagine. This is my class. So I used to take a lot of photos. I, I photo journal. This is my class. A lot of them are doing very well right now. Um, I used to sit backbench when you enter on the left, somewhere second last. And then this is my discussion group from first year to fifth year. We just ended up, I don't know how we met. We just sat next to each other in first year. We didn't know each other. This is Johnny. This is Peter and Ted. This two were in Mangu together. Ted and I loosely knew someone and we became friends. We literally sat next to each other in MH2 in October to November 2005. And we were friends since then. I did not know them before. So so friendships, is, it's very interesting. Yeah? You just meet someone. and This is me in the world round, just to show you how like things, I'm sure Kenyatta, I hope it's changed. This was me in Tadia with Sue, my classmate. She's now guiding my laureate. This is when I went to Isiolo. Isiolo was just another funny life. I we were just eating meat. Let me tell you, I added so much weight because because the, the meat in Isiolo was really good. So we used to go to Archer's Post, which is thirty five kilometers from Isiolo, and we had such a great time um, in Isiolo. I just thought I should share some photos of graduation. So these are my classmates. Third uh, December twenty ten. This is Mutei. I think he's back in school doing radiology. Some moved to Germany. We are a uh, public health and this is some big shot in, in one some USAID fund. In fourth year, we used to go for com health. I'm sure you still do it in the community. So this is us having lunch together as a group. Raha is a Duke, Esther is Geneva, Vicky is in MOH. So you see people do well. Sereti is somewhere in UK. And see the other two people. And then this is my other part of the story. So London School. This is our graduation, our final ball before we left. Uh, this is me right here. Some of my classmates, gosh, I haven't done a good job keeping up with many of them, but we, we, we met last in 2018 when I was in the UK. I went to visit them. And then this was me last year, June, July rather, July 3rd, when I came to school. And I was walking around. I took the first photo of, of, of this. So the reason I share all this is really to discuss pivots and career pivots. And to show you how life can sort of go whichever direction you you want to to go oh, and the last two things i'm here with my wife so this is us this is us literally two weeks ago brian chesky was speaking at school uh, i'm sure if you know brian chesky is the founder of uh, airbnb so the school has this thing called view from the top where it's a speaker series led by students and students come and they interview they interview anybody who they want to so this is brian chesky in his yearbook and look at what he wrote Maybe you can't read, but he says, I'm sure I'll amount to nothing. <laughs> so he was being shown that. The reason I share this is, look at even Brancheski, he had really discounted himself and you never know where life can take you. And another interesting bit, I used to watch this thing religiously for like the last four or five years on YouTube. 
so for me it's really surreal sometimes i'm sitting i'm sitting there live watching it while i used to watch on youtube i never imagined i'd be here so talking about careers sorry uh, slide has too many points this is a bad slide but it's important for messaging and i'll share with you when you when you talk about sorry to switch gears when you talk about like pivots and options i think it's important as med students it's important as young doctors uh, to really to really think broad especially from the non clinical options i say this because in kenyatta you have access to i think almost all clinicians you can always talk to them you can always get their side of the story what at least back then i never had was access to folks in the non clinical space so for example, when I was applying to London School, I think it was like two people or three people um, who applied. I, I was probably the only one who went to school that year to do public health. Everybody thought I was absolutely insane because we had a really good run. I was in KMPDU, one of the early members. Um, I don't, I'm sure you know Mwachi Abidan is my classmate. <laughs> I'm actually DU 66, I don't think it's like I left, but uh, I was in the union. I was a founding secretary in Kericho. Sorry, treasurer, when I was in Kiricho County as an intern, we led the strike there. We moved to Isiolo, I became chairman of Apaistan, and then I left to go to school. So you see, I had I had a good thing going on. Like clinical life was perfect, but this burning desire to go to public health, to do health economics, to play a bigger role and a better role in transforming the health system is what made me move. So despite everything being comfortable, despite being in a very nice place, I moved. Same thing in Chai, I was living, I was an expert in Lesotho, like life was so good, I moved. Um, just before GSB, Johnson & Johnson, I was having the time of my life. Like I was literally talking about vaccines day and night, meeting ministries, but I moved. At, at some point, I'm always like, if you start getting too comfortable, I move anyway, just to share. So the non-clinical options, um, the reason I share, as I said, is it's important that you know what's out there. So for example, you could move into management and management could mean anything from being a general manager in like a company to hospital management, managing a unit, managing the whole entire hospital. Um, there's a lot, the last decade, there's been a huge move to healthcare financing and policy. As you know, as we move towards UHT, uh, universal healthcare coverage, and some of these are just buzzwords we love using. But you, you see that there's a, there's a huge move and there are a lot of folks who are now in, in finance, in policy. I would, I still think research is a really important component there's still a lot of doctors who are moving into fields like epidemiology, you do advanced epi, you do, you're doing a PhD in epi, medical statistics, and they have amazing careers after that. So they're non-clinical, but they, they work adjacent to clinicians, like they're helping with you know, planning government rollout of you know, surveys, they're planning clinical trials, it's very important people. They're teaching the next generation of practitioners. And then there's just the mainstream public health, which could be divided into many things like health promotion, we talk about health economics, we talk about health services research. So that so public health is also really broad. There's global health and what happens in global health is also okay, a bit more broad. You could move to industry. And this is all what doctors are doing. And I know doctors in all this field. Yeah? Industries include pharmaceutical where I was, for example, there are a couple of doctors actually in Kenya. There are right now probably around 50 doctors in the pharma industry, uh, the clinical trial world. I don't know if you've heard of groups called CROs or clinical research organizations, uh, like IQVIA, who literally just run clinical trials on behalf of like a sponsor, like a pharmaceutical company. And you could move to the insurance sector. And there are many people in insurance. My classmate Gone was in Jubilee. Gatonga, the CEO of AR was my classmate. So people who just moved to insurance. There are folks who went directly to entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship, there are two options. You could either build or you could join a startup as an early employee. Folks who I know who built, um, my former classmate, uh, Kilonzi, Ngure, uh, and Mudeo Zeya ahead, they're all the old classmates, and then anyway. So they started Savannah Informatics back in 2010, no, 2011, the year after med school. And it's, look at them right now, they're flying. But what people don't see is the, the 13 years that they've been working on this. People only seen the last three years, and they think they're doing well. So you could either build your own thing, or you could join a startup as an early employee and just ride the wave. If you do well, if you don't, that's a different story. You could all become consultants if you want. Just drop medicine, go work in McKinsey, go work in BCG. They, they both have Nairobi offices. Bain is not in Nairobi. You could choose to actually go to politics 
And I'm thinking you've seen doctors now in the union. That's a good sort of grooming ground to get into politics. I used to be in the union. I know all these folks I used to work with them. Um, you could directly go to national politics. I'm seeing doctors. You know that we have doctors like Dr. Nikal, who's, who's, who's in politics, Dr. Pokose. Uh, I don't know if Simi Yesel is still there, Bonik Halwale. So, so there's a good number of doctors who can mentor you. We have even the younger doctors like uh, Kina, our folks, um, our, our classmates who sort of, like Oma Uluga, who was chair. Oma was in 60 and more when I was finishing in Nairobi. So you could join politics, you can go it into finance and investments, and I'll just mention this briefly, gosh, I'm talking too much. Eh? And this, you can be an investment banker, you can move into venture capital, PE, hedge funds, or you could go into law, you could do both. And a good example is Stella, you should get Stella to speak to you, Stella Bosire. She's doing a degree in law, she finishes, she can now double both, both medicine and law easily. I was told to speak briefly about venture capital and maybe specifically in Africa, what it entails. Um, so when you start a company, there are many ways of getting financing. Let me just say, there are, there are many options and venture capital is one. So not to confuse many people. So VC is just a type of financing aimed at high growth companies with the potential of having like significant returns down the road. And usually uh, someone would invest a minority position. So for example, they take 20% and a board seat for preferred for, for, pre, for shares, for equity. And the reason they're investing in you is you're in a high growth industry. Like they want you to grow crazy. They're not looking for something small. So the, the traditional talk in VC was they're looking at 10 times growth in like five or six years. So what they will tell you is they want you to grow three times year one, three times year two, two times year three, two times year four. It's a bit outdated, but that's sort of the rough guide. So triple, triple, double, double. The reason I share this is there are many financing options. And I know now people are getting more in touch with VC and they know it's a big thing. But when you're starting a business, when you're starting a venture, you could literally bootstrap. You could start with the little money you have and grow it. You can go to a bank and get loan or debt. There are other things like private debt, not even banks, the institutions that give you debt. You can go into private equity. For example, you can go to KMA Sako. KMA Sako now has loans for doctors who are looking to set up practices, dental practice. You can, you can get it all. And these are just some of the numbers that came into VC in Africa in 2022, around 6.5 billion. But just to give you a comparison in the US in Silicon Valley, where I am, it's around 242 billion last year. So it's small. But important to note, it's just one type. It's like two to 3% of companies only get VC. Majority is actually bootstrapping or, or, or bank debt. And this is just a spread in Africa where the money in venture capital is going. Like it's usually the top four we say, Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, and Kenya are usually the ones that get most of the, the, the VC money. I thought I'll give you very practical examples on where my friends have ended up since we graduated, because it's really important you have this in, 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 in like this sort of alternative view. Maybe Matiko talked about it, but allow me to share. So we graduated around 300 people in my class in 2010. I know now the class size is a bigger. And a sample of what folks have done, some people in WHO and CDC, these are sort of the government, uh, I would say bodies or agencies uh, focusing on global health and in many angles of it. I have two classmates, actually a couple. A couple have hospitals, but two have done really well. There's Maxi, uh, who's your friend, I'm sure, uh, Rye Family Hospital. He has an insurance company strapped on it, like, so he's doing really well. There's my other classmate too many people don't talk to, but I think she should, she should even come and talk to you. Uh, she started Kori Family Hospital in, in Kimilili, in Kitale, like, and she's doing really well, uh, Sue, Simio. Gatonga is in the AR insurance. He started in McKinsey. He went to uh, CIC, or UAP, sorry, and now he's in AR as a CEO. Gone moved from Jubilee to Palladium, which is like a healthcare financing thing by USAID. I have a couple of classmates in Camry Welcome Trust who are doing their PhDs and staying on as researchers. My classmate Raha, for example, moved to Duke. She, she's working in the research team at Duke University over here. There's a huge component of folks in the pharmaceutical industry, like this is Pfizer, this is Roche, and many others. So, so just to show you the non-medical sort of alternatives where people end up. And now to the third part of the presentation, and the last one is really to talk about pivots, when to pivot, how to pivot, why you should pivot. So I'd say 
something interesting and and literally the way to think about a pivot maybe to take it back a bit is is for example you're a doctor and you're focused on your clinical career and at some point you're like i need a break or maybe this is not what i want to do and you want to move into something like finance how do you how do you make that move how do you move to finance and some pivots are sort of logical and can occur, but some are illogical and it's hard. For example, you can't say I'm pivoting to become an engineer without having gone back to study engineering. But for, for example, you can pivot into business, you can pivot into consulting based on what you know without too much. So when is the best time? School is always an, an amazing opportunity to pivot. And by school, I mean, for example, you've started medicine, you're, you're in your career and you're like, no, let me let me move to something else. So you can use that one year in school to, to, to pivot. And pivot can occur like in many ways. You can pivot in terms of function. So you can, for example, move from in the same company. You would say you're a doctor, you can move from being um, like just a GP in the clinic, you can become like the head of the head of the unit. That's that's like a small pivot of promotion. You could pivot by Industry, for example, you can leave healthcare, you can go to finance, or you can pivot by geography. You can leave Kenya, you can go to the US. So it could be either one, two, or three of them. So, so those are types of pivots. How to think about pivoting. How else can you pivot? Things like hobbies. For example, you might find um, my good friend, Brian Omina. I didn't put his photo. Brian Omina is now in Nairobi Hospital, but one of the things he did really well is in med school, he started a clothing line called Vazi. When I was with him, actually, in Soweto, it used to be don't make in Soweto. And he just scribbled on a piece of paper. He was big on fashion. He started it. And Vazi was doing well for a long time. So that's something. And it became his side hustle. I've seen that people pivot due to side hustle. So you start like a small computer shop and it just blows up. It becomes huge. You start a business, it becomes huge. And the other way is promotions. If you get promoted within the company to something else, and then even if you don't have, you will essentially need to acquire the knowledge. And this is now the how. Every time you're trying to pivot, one of the things you have is a deficit in the knowledge of where you're trying to go. So you need to look for a way to figure out how you're going to acquire the knowledge and the skills necessary for whatever role you're going to. So to give you an example, I, I have, I, I, when I was a clinician and I was moving to, 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 to work in Chai as a health economist and in healthcare financing, one of sort of the knowledge gaps I had was around how does financing work? What are the different types of financing? How did I fill that gap? I was in school. I did health economics. I was able to learn about healthcare financing and policy. I was able to learn about health economics and build economic, uh, uh, do some modeling. So having done economic evaluations and done this, I filled the knowledge deficit and I have the skills now that were necessary for the next uh, thing. Two, you need to be strategic in how you pivot. Uh, some pivots can be wild. Some people sometimes want to jump from here to like extreme. But the way I like thinking about it is you, need, you, you can take three or five years to pivot. It's not a must you do it immediately in one year. And this is something I think we, we often forget as young people. You don't need to pivot everything in one year. You can move slowly from where, from where you are to where you want to be. For example, you can be a doctor, maybe you love finance. We can start by doing a part-time MBA in any program in, in Nairobi. And this is what Gatonga did. Gatonga did a MBA in the University of Nairobi. He, anyway, he'll tell you a story. You can do an MBA. As you finish your MBA, it's get good grades, like a distinction. You move, join like a McKinsey, a consulting firm. You get more general sort of business understanding and knowledge and solve problems. And then after two or three years, you move now to something else that you love. So you see, it's, 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 it's strategic. And then three, you really need to learn to network. And this is something I think in Kenya, it's going to be increasingly important because you have many doctors, many of you are young and, and a lot of jobs are not available, unfortunately. How do people get jobs? At least this is the American way of doing it. And I think in Kenya, it's, it'll start to apply. So the earlier you can start to do this, the better. So start meeting your professors. For example, you're interested in plastic surgery, go talk to Prof Kainga, uh, tag along him and see whether like there's something you can do. Talk to your classmates. You'll always be amazed how many <clears throat> your classmates and the linkages they have and the loose connections they have. Always ask for help if you need help. Don't be afraid of asking for help. And I, and I always emphasize, get good mentors to steer you and guide you. To you. And get mentors around the field of what you want to do. Uh, if you have an idea of what they want to do and just give them like a concrete plan. This is what I want. So this is my experience, the last few slides. Um, just to share some tips I've learned 
this is like the cheat sheet. So I hope I hope it will benefit you. So something I learned in the UK, a lot of my friends from Nigeria, uh, so they want to come to be doctors, they're doctors. They want to trans transfer to UK to become doctors in the UK. But it's really expensive doing clubs. It's really expensive preparing for those exams. You have to go to the UK, you have to pay. So what most of them did is they actually applied to UK for a graduate program. So in London school, I had uh, classmates who either got scholarship or they paid through. But because you're already in the UK, you're already studying, you can actually start taking your club exams in that one year period. You're already there. Don't worry about class. Focus on what you want. You're already there. So they, do, they did the plabs, and I have a good example, a chap called Obi. He did his plabs. He finished. He got his general, um, the, the practice license. And then he immediately got a locum somewhere in north of Scotland for like four months during winter. And you know, he made a lot of crazy money. Uh, there's a good friend you should bring here to speak to you, Job Nengena. He did the same thing when he was in the UK, he finished up his plabs. He practiced, he was doing informatics, and then he stayed on to, 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 to practice. So this is something you young folks should be start thinking about like, okay, maybe plabs is expensive if I'm here. What can I do to help me sort of subsidize the cost? You can be studying there on a scholarship, Commonwealth or anything, and then you're doing this. Two, really try to volunteer in the industry you're trying to look into, you're trying to break into. For example, I volunteered uh, for Kenya Red Cross. I worked in the W refugee camp for, for some time, and it made me really understand the whole sort of humanitarian world, because I was thinking maybe I'll want to work there. Like I really tried to understand how does this work? How does offering care at that level work? Three, and this is a personal thing, don't catch feelings. And, and, and also, trust me, don't follow everything. Just I'm giving you tips, but you decide what you want to do. Something I'm a firm believer in, try as much as possible with all your might and all your power and all your abilities to just go to the top 10 schools in the world. And I know people tell me this is the most elitist thing you can say, but I'm telling them, trust me. I'm a beneficiary of a lot of goodwill by just virtue of the people I've met in some of these schools. So for example, in London school, uh, a lot of my classmates have ended up having amazing research careers, like top positions, but they're in public health. Like my, my interests are not in public health. Like if I wanted to stay there, I know by now I'd be doing really well. So at Stanford, the people I'm meeting here are absolutely insane as well. The reason I say this is we have, we, we usually discount ourselves as Kenyans, as doctors are like, oh, we are not good enough, or we can't get there, just go. Go to the best public health school, go to Karolinska, go to, uh, Leuven, like try their best. Huh? And then networking, just to share some tips, I think which doctors we could always use. Um, first, start, start early. Always start early before you need anything. Just start forming a relationship and a bond. Say, hi, how are you doing? Just ask about general things. Always do your homework on the person. Don't ask obvious things that you can Google. Try and get some unique insights. Oh, like, how did you do this? How did you do that? And then sometimes, uh, this is something new I'm learning offer to solve their problems. This makes you like stick, sticky, essentially you just talk to them. Because the minute they see that you can solve their problems, they're like, ah, okay, we're going to work with this. Maybe this is my last slide. Think of life as a life and your career as a marathon. It's not a sprint. I never understood this, like for a long time, I never understood this until at some point, like mid 2015, I was like, okay, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, take risks. When you can, don't be afraid of risks. Don't be afraid of doing the craziest things you've ever imagined. Con contrarian bets, just to share, sometimes I believe it works out well. Like when you see everybody going one side and, and you are sure you don't want to go there, don't. Go to where you believe, go to the other side. Don't follow the flock. And I know they say that, but trust me, you'll still follow the flock. An example is in my life, public health. When I was going for public health, I think I was the only one at that point from my class who went to public health and everybody thought I'm, my good friends thought I'm actually insane. But see, it's worked. When I joined pharma, everybody was like, what's going on in pharma? <clears throat> Although there was a good base of people in pharma, it was still not well understood. Now see pharma is, is, is huge. And I just thought I should share with you some wise words from a poem that I really love by Mary Oliver. She passed away a few years ago. It's called The Summer Day. And the last line of the poem says, tell me, what it is that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Thank you. Come, come study here. This is still just me. Wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, we can hear you and we've been with you throughout. Um, that's amazing. Um, I, I, 
I think I'm going to use someone else's thoughts to ping back and seg this next moment. So I, I, someone here has written half times are lasting. I'm very curious as to why they've written this. I'm not sure if it's because of um, how you just taking us heavily inspired, not just inspired, but heavily. <laughs> And um, it's it's even just the last note that you've even just left for us there. What is it that we're going to do with our one precious lives and telling us to do audacious things like just, I repeat, just go to the top 10 schools of the world. Um, I'll definitely be asking more about that. Someone is appreciating Mary Oliver. So um, let me just begin to share the screen. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And um, just to orient people in, I'd even like to direct you to look at the participants we have, Dr. Mube. So, so many, I'm even shocked. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're telling you, min we're doing what was minimum 30, and we have- I thought we were 13 in starting, anyway, but I'm happy. Thank you folks for coming to listen to my stories. It's, mm. it's uh, just to share, I mean, Palo Alto, it's 10, 10 a.m. So mm. I have time. It's, I'm all worried about you, but happy to take questions. Yeah. Exactly, you're 10 hours behind us. So guys, you can start writing your questions in the comments that we can even be able to gauge how many they are. So we can be able to give as many of them a chance as we can. But let us um, start with the ones which were submitted. Sorry, I'm just trying to share it. Jivanji, sorry, can I just comment on seeing Jivanji? Yeah, please, comments. could you show the picture of Jivanji again? Just so people can see. <laughs> This is the real thing. It's the real, be, it's a real Jivanji, story. Even in Tadia, we used to go to, to Jivanji. Let me tell you, we refused to move from Jivanji. First year, Jivanji, second year. Uh -huh. I think even fourth year, sometimes we used to meet at Jivanji. Like, we really love this place, um, this green bench. But the first two years, we conquered it absolutely. Every Saturday, this was Saturday, eh? mm. Saturday from nine to two, and then we'd go for lunch. And then this is my friend Kimani. Kimani would come not having read and prepared. I should bring him here. He's a, he's a clown. What? And then he forces us to read. You see, he's reading because he didn't read before. Because you're coming to discuss. You're not coming to read. Hey, personally, you're, you're, I'm feeling attacked <laughs> because I am Kimani. <laughs> so on behalf of all Kimanis, please, guys, just bear with us. Before exams, you know, sometimes we really contribute because, you know, we're really charging that time. But the rest of the time, he degree the Harambe Kidogo. That's what I can stop huh? sharing. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I, but also, I have a friend who literally just side commented me and talked about how she loves that you're also like um, gassing up your friends or that you're mentioning all the people that you went oh, to with, true. what they're doing, where they are. And wow, you, you've been really share. Fast. Doc, sorry, happy to share. So this is Kimani. Kimani left medicine in 2012. He was in Thika. Mm -hmm. he, one day he was driving to work. He was like, fuck it. Anyway, sorry, I'm cussing. But he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. He left. <laughs> so he moved to business. Um, he's now doing some insane stuff in food and uh, processing and manufacturing. Peter works in Novo Nordisk and Ted is doing cardiology in Kenyatta. So you might see Ted. Dr. Teddy Brian Ocheng, say hi to him. And Sue is doing obs in. She's an obs guy in Kericho. And these wow. are my people. This hey. is for Thea. Mm, wow. Amazing. All right, then. Um, thank you for that warm. Um, uh, yeah, it, honestly, it's so relatable. Like, you have no idea how seeing that stuff is. It makes it so real for us. So um, I'll start with questions closest to the heart. I put these ones together, although they're coming from different people. Um, so how did you discover your passion for what you do currently? What would you tell your younger self? What was the journey like? Challenges and lessons, quite a loaded question. And then um, maybe this one is more palatable to start with as we deconstruct that first one. What can I do now start as a student in second year to make my game top notch when I graduate from a world-class perspective? I assume this person wants to be a world-class citizen or graduate no no absolutely thank you very tough questions and i'm happy to try and answer i hope i'll, I'll do you justice uh, first of all thank you to the folks who are here like i think we started with 15 or 20 so seeing 120 i'm like hey. um in terms of 
let me start by starting now what, what you I think the way you can think about it, whether you're in med school, second year, third year. So one of the things, um, there, are two, there are two parts. There are people who sort of already know what they want to do. And I genuinely believe there are people who, for example, came to med school, they want to be pediat pediatricians or OBS guys, and they're focused. So if you already know what you want to do and you're focused, just continue pursuing it. My only caveat is as you pursue it, if you change your mind, feel free to always revisit. Don't, don't change your mind and then you keep struggling. Don't force. If you feel this is not for you, feel free to change. The second part is folks who come in to med school, uh, they did well in high school like I did. And really there was, I was like, yeah, I can't do engineering, I can't do law, and I'm trying to discover what I love. And so I just experimented. I was all over the place. I was like in Kenyatta, I was trying to turn on people. I was here, I was there. We were in the research group, but it was still in its infancy. Um, I did my electives at CAVI with Kenya AIDS Vaccine Initiative. They're doing a phase one early, like for HIV vaccine. We sat down, we learned about the recruiting process. Yeah, go talk to Profanzala if you're interested in like virology and vaccines. So, so the way I'd say, whatever you're interested in, uh, talk to the people in KNA you have as, um, as your professors, as your supervisors, lecturers. Uh, if you're interested as a group, even better, go as a group so that, for example, prof is not seeing one person at a time and you're 10 of you and you're all in the same class. Just go 10 and say, look, prof, we want to learn about vaccines. Can you have an informal session with us the next five weeks, one hour every week? Tell us how clinical trials work or tell us how vaccine trials work. There are younger chaps in the university like Masika approaching, talk to Masika and say, hey, Masika, here you're doing this virology thing. What are you doing? Volunteer to go. We used to go for med camps. We did all those things. Go, go discover. So my point is, if you don't know what you love, just go discovering. And I'll also say the second thing is um, the internship is a very important year. It was at least for me. Because internship actually allows you to put to practice a lot of the things you've learned and you've been doing in med school. And because of that, you start discovering whether it's some things that you're passionate or not. <clears throat> for example, internship, like I ended up loving pediatrics. I didn't even know I'd be a good pediatrician, but I had a really good time in PIDS. I loved PIDS. I loved spending time with kids. I would carry them in the ward on as I'm talking to mothers. I would love talking to parents. Uh, I, I thought I'd like surgery, surgery. I was like, ah, it, it, was, it wasn't all that I thought it would, but my friends, for example, loved surgery. Mm. Obstain was my first rotation. It was intense. It was where I got my first mortality. But I still gave it my all and I loved it. Uh, so, so internship, I think, played a huge role in sort of from a clinical perspective, helping you understand where you lie. So that's how I think you could go. Um, don't worry, if you want to graduate, there may, I think for, you, for your class, you have opportunities. Go to, go to all these medical conferences that are there. I went to, funny enough, I went to a conference when I was in Tadia, I think a week before exams in Zanzibar. We went to Zanzibar with Ajuju. You know Ajuju is a plastic surgeon. Okay. We went there at the, at the, to, to a medical conference for students. I didn't even present. We just went for tourism. One week before exam. One week. But the people I met there are still my friends until today. So 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 go for it. Passion. Uh, same thing. For passion, really, for me, I, I had a challenge sometimes being in Kenyatta. And just to take you back, maybe you're a bit here. In 208, we had post-election violence. Kenyatta was full. Like Kenyatta was mayhem. I was in third year. That was my first clinical year. People were under the bed, we were doing surgeries, and I was like, man, we need to change how healthcare works. Like, this cannot be the one hospital receiving everybody, like from such a whole, almost a whole country. So how can I play a better role to help just allocate resources more downstream? And so throughout med school, I was like, can I really do this clinical thing? So I kept on exploring public health. I checked out which public health schools exist. So it's something I kept on just taking out what's out there. Uh, when I finished, I did a lot of work. Um, like when I was in Solo, for example, Dr. Kigondo made me acting med soup. So I managed to see how it is be, like being in leadership management. Uh, we went for those supervision visits. We did some public health stuff. So, so as I said, keep trying. That's when I was like, okay, this works. What would I tell my younger self? Man, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. I think I used to try and sprint. I used to think, oh, we need to do this by then. We used to do this by then. And um, yeah, that's how the journey has been. I hope I've answered. All right. Um, I don't know if the person who sent these questions in has had it answered, but if we don't see these questions again in any way, shape, or form, then I believe we've been profusely answered. Um, thank you. 
let we can go to the next the next one so um i try to order them in how the story is building up so now i guess this is after you're building up your foundations experimenting as you described and finding um different interests even just as an undergraduate or an intern would you advise undergraduates to further their studies abroad as compared to kenya if one is looking to finally work in Kenya. And I really resonate to this question. And I think I mentioned it to you earlier. Are you also coming back? And mm. um, yeah, what does all this, what do all these international credentials mean? Because actually there was a speaker we were talking to and he talked about how if he had gone to study his postgraduate abroad, I mean, he, he, <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate to mention, but I talked about how even like you're setting up your life, you might end up leaving children in that country, you know, like um, there's a lot that goes with investing and replanting yourself and, uh, and planting yourself from different places. So maybe you can also add that context, even with concern to your life as to how being abroad and finally settling here and how that has shifted over the years no, i love this that's an amazing question so i'm fortunate to have lived in five countries i think so far it's number five yeah other than kenya and um i'd say so so everything really depends on an individual it's very hard to answer like from a broad base that's a first thing it depends on your motivations and inspirations why do you want to go abroad and why do you want to go back to Kenya or to stay to study in Kenya? The thing I'd say is uh, from a public health perspective, my and the way I look at it, and this is very personal. Eh? So everybody, please have your own opinion. I'm a firm believer if you're trying to do public health, try and go to uh, Australia as a doctor, try and go to some of the best institutions in the world that practice public health. Why? Because you're trying to, public health is tough. There are many people doing public health. It's, a, it's like a really saturated market. So at the end of the day, you're trying to differentiate yourself. So what value addition are you bringing to the table? For example, from someone who did public health in any Tanzania, Uganda, any country, Nigeria, versus you, what else are you bringing? So going, going abroad for one, trying to differentiate myself, two, trying to get this global mindset of, of, of how sort of public health works, at a more global level and, and not really um, East Africa or Kenya, because it changes, how we are taught really changes. Eh? The, the material sort of starts becoming a bit different. Like you're learning about healthcare financing in US versus China versus Europe versus Australia. While in Kenya, I think I just learned about maybe UK and Germany and US. Nobody talks about like other places. So my only advice is first, find out whether you want to go abroad or not. Two, um, if you're happy to go, go work abroad. Uh, I'd say the thing, the thing with abroad, so the benefits, I'll be say it up with you. The benefits is, for example, if you're a clinician and you work abroad, like doctors in the US are making three, four, five hundred K. Easy, easy per year. Although you're in school for 10 years, but they're making much more as consultants. In Kenya, they're not making much more. It's better quality of life, but they have a lot of physician burnout. The challenge that I've seen a lot is community. The sense of community like really lacks sometimes. You, you, if, if, you, if you love your support system, if you love your friends, your family, uh, if you really depend on them, it can be tough if you're abroad. So you have to balance that out. And then depending on, for example, if you're married or not, if you're married, maybe your partner wants to, to, to either stay or to come back to Kenya. So you have to think of all these things. Uh, where are your kids going to school? Do you want them to be grounded in Kenya? Do you want them to be grounded in US initially and then they move? So there are all these considerations. So there's no one factor. Maybe I'll answer something interesting I've seen as well. Someone has asked me how I ended up to London school. So I did not go to London school on a scholarship. I tried the first year in 2012 for a scholarship, I failed. I tried the second year in 2013, I failed. So I went to school. And there are many ways to do this, but I did something crazy. So <laughs> I don't think I should tell you this. So I just decided to, I just decided to, to go to school. So I literally, um, I went, anyway, I'll tell you because it's part of learning. I went, to, I went to a bank, I took a bank loan, I paid fees, I went to school. I was listed on the CRB. I was like, it's okay. I'm in London. I'm studying. I'll come back to Kenya and I'll pay it. And I came back and I paid it within 18 months because now my income straight up, it tripled from what I used to make um, initially. So the opportunity cost was high. I took a big risk. I, I borrowed to go to school. 
and it paid off. It might not pay off for everybody, but for me, it paid off because I knew what I was targeting and what I was working on. Yeah. And actually, um, maybe even before we go to that question, because I think the question of financing will definitely come up a lot. Um, so like uh, you mentioned even earlier, since even before you had left um, school, like even let's say that trip for Zanzibar, or mm -hmm. um, I'd assume your work trips, uh, maybe even your current um, degree as a fellow, how like how would you percentage wise financing your whole journey and all of these investments that have been made into you as an individual as from personal assets from being um supported by work or other people how would you ratio or what has brought you to this point financially that's a great one um so school always paid out of pocket straight up uh, and and so you can apply for scholarships. I, my friends, most of them got scholarships, but I didn't. So I'm a bit of an outlier. I might not be. I might not be the best to advise on getting scholarships. And I'm always open about it. I'm like, I never got. But right now, for example, in Stanford, I have a student loan and I have a component of financial aid, so it's both. Because mm. yes, it's just. In terms of trips, um, so something smart I used to do. So I used to travel a lot in Novo Nordisk. Like two weeks every month, I was somewhere. So two weeks home, two weeks traveling sometimes even three so for example i would go to botswana i'm working uh monday to friday monday to thursday i would spend the weekend there so i'd arrive on sunday i finish work on thursday i'd spend friday saturday sunday i come back sunday night what i would do is i would just get everything from the office like the way it is the work schedule and then i would change the ticket on my own i would pay for my own things so I would I used I took I took advantage of a lot of work trips to to experience a local area, but outside of work, not with work. Like it would always be, I'd spend a day or two. I remember we went to Senegal back in 2018 with my wife. Spent 10 days in Senegal just touring. But I was in Senegal for one week for meetings. We finished. She joined me on my own cost, and she we we went all over the place. So there there are ways you could think about uh, traveling. Back in med school, of course, it's tough. Eh? You know, Zanzibar people are going by bus. It's it's a different story. We went by bus, okay, I didn't, but folks went by bus to Dar es Salaam, they crossed the ferry, but we are students, it's fun, it's a big group. Stayed in a cheap hotel, I think the hotel the whole week was what, 3K or something, it was ridiculous, it was so cheap. Budget for the whole trip was 15K. Mm. For one week in Zanzibar, 15K. <laughs> so, so, so there, 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 are ways to, there, there are ways to go about um financing and even right now for example i'm a student like you and i insist again i'm a student like you so now i've had to adjust how i think of money and budgets and traveling i'm no longer living like the way i used to i'm a bit more physically uh, i have more physical responsibility mm. all right it. then now the big brain questions are coming out in a lot and a lot of them have to do with pharma so i'm trying to see if i should if you should address them all at once um so there's okay there's this one how to progress into medical investments pharmaceuticals medical tech firms after graduation without opting for medical practice or internships well you've answered this a lot through your i mean you your you, your post internship so this person sounds like the moment they get their degree up or they've been given by prof kiama straight to no no, go. Like, who's your girlfriend? Take risks. I wish I could even show you that slide. Take risks. I'll give you two examples. One are my classmates, uh, Kilonzi um, and Gure. Uh, Savannah Informatics. I don't know if you heard of them. They keep quiet a lot. You should look for them. But they are, like, they are good. Eh? They're very good people. Kilonzi didn't go for internship. Straight up. He finished. He went to Duke, did a master's in clinical informatics, came back, continued doing what he was doing. He went to work in Bain as a consultant. So there are people who just say the internship is not for me, not even internship. They just got the degree, bounced. There are folks who, like Kimani, my boy, who used to disturb us in discussion groups, who did internship and then he quit as an emo. He's like, what is this? A decade later, he's doing well. He's okay. So, like, there, there's no one formula. You can finish. You can bounce. You can even, you can even take the degree on the plane as you go. Like, don't worry. Just. Yeah, like, like the world is your oyster. Do what you feel is is right. 
Mm. I think on the farmer issue, something has asked something interesting. How to get into big farmers? Um, this is a, is a question I get every, every time. And I'd say there's no one straight answer. And, and I'm happy you can invite the folks in farmer who can tell you how they got in. Everybody has a different story how they got in. So in, the, in terms of medical, in the pharma industry, there, there are various grades. So what often would happen traditionally, folks would start as MSLs or medical science lessons, original medical advisors. That's like the, the lower cadre. And that's essentially, they go to the field, they meet doctors on a regular, discuss it. Out. And then you become medical advisor, senior medical advisor, medical manager, and then you start moving to senior manager, director. So when the MSL roles would be available, folks used to get in. Now they're not available as much. Alternative is medical advisor. I have my good friend, Steve Amaya, who just got in as a medical advisor. Uh, there are many other pathways to get into pharma. So for example, if you love marketing, they're always looking for marketers. Mm. Of course in marketing. Yeah. Dr. Githinji, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Gigi, uh, Amref, yeah? Gigi, yeah. Gigi Tahi, for example. You know, if he was in GSK, he's done so much before. Um, if you love sales, you want to sell, Go for it. Then your MBA, you feel like I want to be a salesperson. So you go pay back to the story of take risks. Like, don't feel like, oh, I did this medical degree. Why am I going to sell drugs? Why am I doing this? Just follow your passion. If that's your passion, not really passion, just follow what you feel where you belong and you need to pay bills anyway. Wow. And um, there's market access. So health economics, the other angle is doing health economics, understanding how market access works. It's not big in our region. It's starting to evolve and develop, but it's big in Europe, big in the US. Mm. That's another answer where doctors come. And come yeah. So then even just, I'll just ask you um, to hold the thought before we go to the health economics, because there's actually a question that will come on that. So we can finish the branch for big pharma. Someone here is asking a very uh, philosophical question. Um, and they've just talked about how in the USA that it's been under a lot of scrutiny for and ethical practices, for instance, the opioid crisis and this opioid pandemic, we're always hearing about what's happening mm -hmm. in the States. And um, so, yeah, as a member of the industry, do you meet such situations every day? And does it put you, uh, your moral code under duress for those years at Novo? No, Novo is an amazing company, let me not lie. Novo Nordisk is like Danish. Uh, and, and so something we don't even talk about in medical school, I think uh, is a culture. Before you join any company organization, you sort of need to understand the culture and and what sort of what it entails. So the one is a Danish company, like North Europeans have this very sort of family-centric culture, values driven. Um, some companies don't have that. So you see the opioid pandemic, which was pushed by the Sackler family, like they managed to essentially just game the system and uh, they they did the same. So it's 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 tough. Depends on the company you work and the, the, the sort of the moral code. For example, GNJ. GNJ is in a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. They're they still in court right now, being sued because of the baby powder, talc powder, and uh, association with ovarian cancer. And see, as someone who works in GNJ, you're like, man, is this really good? Like, am, am I doing something right? It's questions we'll always face, but I always say it's personal. One, you decide why you're there and what you're being. Two, you just try and get a good employer. And three, if you feel it's not for you, if you feel it's unethical, if you feel you're not right, don't stay. And have, stay. You, have you ever found yourself in any such situation? I mean, other the out, outside of um, even the company that you worked at or in any other path? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, no I, I usually walk away. I'm, I'm, I'm always walking away. Um, I'm, I'm, so for example, but I work away for different reasons. So for example, if police I'm stopped for traffic, I never bribe. I'm like 20, 20 police stations. So I'm usually the fighter. 20, I've gone to court so many times. <laughs> I'm so lucky they don't have those court records. I'm always there defending myself. I'm like, because I'm like, Z, miss could bribe, she Or you talk your way out of it. You also learn the art of negotiating. Oh, I'm a doctor, I'm broke. Mm. Uh, so, so you'll always find people ready to compromise you. And something I've learned now at Stanford is, and I'd, I'd advocate for you folks to do this is just come up with uh, your values. What's your value system? What are you willing to, pro to, to so what drives you? How, how do you sort of wake up in the morning and how do you think of life? So I actually wrote down like my, my values, just three uh -huh. And one of them is respect. Mm -hmm. 
two is really kindness, and three is this sort of value of wanting to sort of give back to folks. So younger than you've me. come up with your own policy yeah. SOPs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my SOP. Respect, kindness. And other other people like, yeah. Actually, people liking me, me, I don't care. Like, I don't, for example, you don't need for people to like you. That's something I've learned. So, so some things I'm like, it's okay. I don't need to be like, or you don't need to be flashy. No, you don't. Like, it's just, these are the things I value. This is what drives me. This is what I'll work on. And this is how I'll sort of treat people. On plain paper for yourself. Wow. I will definitely take that and sit down and come up it's with it. policy. Can I just say, guidelines. I'm worried about I'm seeing yeah. on the comments, people are commenting on this, the trick I gave you. <laughs> Wait, don't go to banks and bring problems and reference me. <laughs> oh, hey, people, yeah, that one. You've seen the likes that it's generating. Um, and, and anyway, I just share that because sometimes I see doctors. Doctors are funny people. You have a fat paycheck. You have a huge paycheck. And everybody's like, oh, Walter, how do we get into school? We have an admission. How do we get scholarships? I'm like, you already have an admission. What else do you, what are you, who are you waiting for to save you? Nobody's coming to save you. Mm. There are people, this is how people go to school. <laughs> One, either you have family money. And never be afraid. If you have family money, you take advantage, go. Two, you either get a scholarship, you go. Three, you figure it out. How do you figure it out? Either take a loan from your friends, take a loan from a bank, take a loan from the circle, go to school. If you figure that's what you want. So so, so don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid that you, oh, I'll have a bad record. Oh, no, no, don't worry. Okay. Then uh, maybe this, then we can talk about the health economics questions that people had addressed here. So um, I'm not sure if you had answered this question of what the best master's program someone should do if they want to break big into big pharma, except the MBA or health economics. But could you also answer, um, it's Masi Limo, she asked, what was the underlying basis behind pursuing health economics and policy? The branches of public health are numerous and without background knowledge, it may be a hard decision to make. So people are already thinking of masters to the peer. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's that's an amazing, uh, just that that's a very good question because I get asked a lot. Um, so, Getting into getting into big pharma, um, there, there, there are many, as I said, there are many routes. In terms of masters, there's no one masters. It could be anything. It could be an MBA, you could do health economics, or you could do marketing. You could do, like you could literally do literature, depending on how you get in, like the many ways you can get in. So Masi, there's no one masters that will help you get in. Um, even first of all, there are people who don't even have a master when they're in. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying there, there's no one, not to mention names, but there are a couple of there are good people who are in. They don't have a master's program. So, yeah. What else? Sorry, what's the second part? Did I miss something else? About that yeah. Question? So, um, the, now that other people are asking, other than the health economics one, what mm -hmm. other oh. master's programs are hot kicks mm -hmm. at the moment to break big into pharma? Except MBA or health economics. Other than, or other programs. Uh, one is none. Two, as I said, you could do marketing. Uh, three, you can literally, you can literally do like, um, the, like these adjacent programs or masters in finance, if you're interested in finance, masters in management, not MBAs, they're adjacent to it. And, um, there are some specific courses on, there's a master's in pharmaceutical economics that's very specific, targeting folks who want to go work in health economics departments in pharma companies. So you have a lot, you have a lot of um, those options. Yeah, I'd say there's there's no one, like I've looked at people in pharma industry, is, there's no one master's they did. Everybody came from, the people with PhDs who literally just have a PhD in science and they got in. They have a PhD in biotech and they got in. And um, another question here is talking, wanted to ask more about, of, about your experience in the government of Kenya. So just your role, your experience, your, in your view, decisions at that level inclined towards addressing scientific problems or making a few individuals happy. Yeah. So let me try and refer. I know. Okay. 
<laughs> no, I get you. See, this is just branding. See, I was an intern like you folks. You'll be very soon. And then I worked as an MO. But when I was working as an MO, I had the added responsibility of... Um, like at some point I was acting med soup. We did some supervision visits. I was like, we did so much work um, with the union trying to negotiate with our people in Upper Eastern back then before it became, the union became centralized like 2014, 15. They became a bit more organized. It used to not be that organized before. Um, yeah, so so it was more caregiving. But look, when you're branding yourself, if you say I worked in Isiolo District Hospital, nobody knows where Isiolo District Hospital is other than in Kenya. Just put very general terms that they can understand. Government of Kenya, Tosha. The rest you can explain how you did um, work. How did I find myself in Stanford? That's a good question. And uh, there's two. How did I find myself in Stanford? Sorry, I'm just taking the questions now. Is uh, I applied for this program called the MSX program. It's a mid-career program. And it's physical, it's one year full-time. And uh, I applied because I wanted to take a break from what I used to do in Johnson & Johnson, um, working on the COVID-19 pandemic uh, response. Yeah, that's how I ended up. Just applied, got in, I'm enjoying myself. There's a question on, oh, branches in public health. Yes, Massey, sorry, that one. Branches in public health are many. There are so many. And really, at some point you can get confused. So what I say in London school, they have this public health general. General literally means you take units from all these other things that you're interested in, but you end up with a very general degree. So you can do some health economics, you can do some health promotion, you can do some AP. Uh, so you can, you can, do, you can do that. Um, it's very confusing. Happy to have an offline chat because that goes on. I'm happy to share my email um, with, with you all. And um, maybe I'll take... Let, let me let the boss continue. Look at me taking over your meeting. Thank you. Continue. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all right. Um, so even I'm um, seeing some more questions are coming back to me. So I'll just read them for us. So what is the effect of these financial institutions in shaping the health landscape in our country? And is this a cause for concern due to capital flight, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. Or like, uh, that's, hey, what's that, Kenya? That's a big issue in the US right now. So what's happening, a lot of private equity firms are buying hospitals because hospitals generate a lot of good revenue. Like there's this concept of recurring revenue. Money just keeps on coming every year. People are always sick. So they love it because you can buy a hospital, you can load it with the debt, you can make some money off it. So I think healthcare, healthcare is becoming interesting at least in Kenya because now you see for example Avenue Hospital is owned by TPG I don't know if they've sold TPG is a private equity firm and they came in they gave the money they built it became what it is right now uh, from being a small hospital so there's that aspect where they've improved in performance they've improved in quality they've improved in their offering but people are worried hey are these people just doing this now so that they later start increasing prices and taking advantage of us we haven't gotten there I can't comment on it but seeing what's happening in the US, a lot of hospital chains are now owned by PE farms. They're jacking up mm. prices. Insurance is paying much more. Uh, there's a whole issue around how much are we paying. Just to give you the numbers, US spends. But even yeah. just so that we don't, in medicine, yeah, but yeah, yeah. addicted to abbreviations. Maybe yeah, yeah. PE for those. Oh, sorry, PE is private equity. P is private equity. Okay. <laughs> I remember my prof, second prof Oglendo. Don't use short form. Hey, those professors are tough, I tell you. Wait. Um, yeah, so private equity. So, so to give you numbers in US healthcare system, because this is absolutely insane. They spend approximately $4 trillion on healthcare. Like this year, they'll spend $4 trillion. $1 trillion will go to Medicare. Medicare is a government-funded public program for mm. people 65 years and above. Approximately, like another five, six hundred million is going to Medicaid, billion rather, going to Medicaid. So it's it's insane. Like the numbers I see out here, I'm like, wow. Why? Because there's a lot of cost inflation. Why is there cost inflation? Salaries are high. People want to make a profit. Procedures are high. Like you're doing. I have. I'll just give you an example. My classmate delivered the baby here the other day. They did a cesarean section. Thirty thousand dollars. Like that's it. That's it. That's it. That's that's what they're supposed to pay. Wow. Can you imagine? I've given my number because I can see people will message me and soon. Uh, yeah, and even actually, oh. it's quite a lot of. I have time. I yeah. have time. Eh? Feel yeah. free to close the time, but I have time for everybody. Oh, okay. so it's really up to you. Okay, then if 
Okay. But the appetite of the people, we shan't quench it if you're able. Then um, just to break the ice a bit in that mm -hmm. health systems direction that we are going, there's someone mm -hmm. who really would like your mm -hmm. take on what your go-to icebreaker is when networking. <laughs> and honestly, I've been because you really, you really emphasize, and I think that's one takeout we all really need at this point is this mm. act of networking and what it really means at each stage of our lives. Uh, I should share that slide. I don't know if people are here. Um, yeah, so you can share what your icebreaker is and what networking means to yeah. you. Does it mean making uh, lifelong friends all the time? Does it mean um, mm -hmm. making acquaintances? Does it mean just simply having contacts in your phone? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll share this. I don't know if everybody was here. Oh, sorry, my chat is on. Oh. I wanted to just share again some networking norms and networking tips so that you folks could sort of really, because this is important. Eh? Like I think if there's important parts of my presentation, this is one of them. So, so networking is really important for many things. One, uh, if you're looking into your career, career growth, it's important you get the right set of mentors, the right sort of sponsors, or the right sort of advisors on your on your panel. And sponsor is not in the Kenyan sense of sponsor. Sponsor is literally someone in the company who likes you, who knows you, and that we need to sponsor your growth you know, and planning and, and that. Mentor could be anybody external. Advisors could also be external. So mentorship is really important. How do I go about it? Uh, because I'm here at Stanford, one of the, you look at your uniqueness. The unique thing about me is I have worked on the COVID-19 pandemic, and I worked in the Ebola pandemic as well. So my icebreaker is always, hi, I'm Walter. I'm a medical doctor from Kenya. And just before the GSP, I worked with J&J on the pandemic response, COVID and Ebola. But next question is, how was that? And then we just go. We go. So something you really have to develop, and I'm happy to share some content later on, is, is your storytelling. Like, you really have to develop your storytelling. I know we're taught medicine, we're taught to think of all these things, but you have to you have to have your elevator pitch ready. You have to be, you have 30 seconds with the dean. What are you going to tell the dean? You have 20 seconds with someone. What are you going to say? So always have uh, your elevator pitch, elevator pitch ready. Yeah. And some of the things as I said, is just try to do your homework. Don't ask obvious questions. If you can offer solutions to the problems that they have, and then they, they keep on wanting you and they keep on needing you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that, for reiterating on that. So, um, okay. I'm really trying to see how we can organize these questions as best as we can. So um, coming back to, <clears throat> um, I hope Cyrus, actually Cyrus, could you just comment on the comments if uh, he, also encapsulated the question on personal branding and how people create it. So um, some questions directly to me, how can a future, you had mentioned something earlier and I also saw some people commenting about it earlier and how today um, patriotism is not a topic mm -hmm. and because of um, just the environment that Kenya has become, um for the new future for for the near future for doctors and even how we had even asked about what your thoughts are on coming back regardless of whether it's a clinical or non-clinical route um what you had mentioned earlier uh, before the meeting that africa is a very big place um for opportunities let alone kenya mm -hmm. so um yeah, could you just talk about that vision or that those kind of hopes or the insight that you have on that, especially for the future medical entrepreneur and how they can get funding from these groups you had mentioned and even what it means to have a world-class degree? Absolutely, yeah. So just to say, uh, I know it's getting late for you folks. So I'm happy to go until like uh, for the next 12 minutes. Yeah, if it's okay until 9.30 your time. But I'm happy to continue, but we can have a hard stop at 9.30. So, okay. so just to share um, the, in terms of, in terms of where I, what I think about international, Africa-wide and, and coming back home and patriotism, straight up, these are my own views again. Some of these things I think are really person dependent. It really depends on what you think and where, where your values lie. There are folks who are like, 
I'm Kenyan, Sitoki Kenya. I have friends who refuse to travel out of Kenya completely, zero. They don't even travel for tourism, like not even to Tanzania for tourism. Yeah, okay. And, and they're doing well and they're thriving and they're making a lot of money and they're like, see, I'm not living in this country. So, so there's no one size fits all. And there are people who move to the US immediately, they finish internship, have never come back. So there's a whole wide range. And then there are people in between who go come, who go come. So I'd say, one of the things is the folks not to, to, to really conflate the issue of patriotism and your career choices and life choices. You can be patriotic, it can be tied to your life choices, but I think it, you can be patriotic even as a Kenyan abroad working because you're still sending money back at home and you're remitting. So you're paying taxes indirectly. So you're still patriotic. So in terms of working, you could work in the US. I gave you this, the tips. I gave you the tip on working in US. I gave you the tip on working in UK. Do a public, you can do a graduate program. I learned this from the Nigerians. And then as you do a graduate program, uh, try and come back. Try, try and do USMLEs or clubs that time, and then you can stay on. Um, in terms of working across Africa, there are so many Kenyans, and this is something people don't realize. There's so many Kenyans across Africa. So I met a chap the other day who was in the UN back in the 70s. He was like, Kenyans were some of the earliest people to join UN when it was starting. Like Kenyans have always been in the UN system. So because I used to travel a lot across Africa, I used to meet folks on the flight. People are in Mali who are Kenyans. Kenyans are in Senegal. They're Kenyans in Ivory Coast thriving, DRC, you know, South Africa. Of course, you know, even in Algeria, Kuna Kenyans. I met some Kenyans in Algeria. So, so there are Kenyans everywhere. So never limit yourself. On, on the geographical uh, spread. The reason I say uh, UK and US for healthcare is because there's a known deficit and a known gap in these countries. One, two, they're willing to take on board folks. Three, they're willing to compensate you adequately for the problems that you'll be going through to get here. It's tough, eh? Acceptance rate is really tough. Yesterday, I met a doctor who came here in the 70s, 79. He said the acceptance rate for USM then was 5%. 5%. But he made it. So it's always been tough. It's all simple. People think these are new. But he's been here. He's a cardiologist for 25 years. Now he works at EY as a, as a manager. He's doing well. So go wherever your heart feels you're comfortable and you want to explore. And I'm happy to link you up. I have classmates in Germany, UK, US, Australia. They're thriving. They're doing so well. Then maybe even on that note, um, there was someone who was asking about, because you went an antinical route, so I don't believe you had to do the USMLE I didn't, or a didn't. specific exam to be able to go to school in the US. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe Edna, um, we can try and get um, information from him where you can also take his number. Um, with yeah. what's and to and unless you have insight about that, about how people transition to following clinical postgraduate studies in countries that require, you know, that have these barriers or these exams, what's your take on that? Sorry, which country is that? Uh, like the US, like if I was going for a clinical postgrad, do you have any insight or pointers as to how people prepare or transition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, um, so there is exams, you know, USMLEs is exams like one, two, three, I think there are three. Yeah? In Kenya, I think it's starting to become more of a thing where like groups practice. So what I've seen people do previously is uh, they come together in groups. So for example, your classmates looking to mm. transition, five of you, you form a study group for USMLEs wow. and questions and answers. It's a joint effort. I think people will confuse these issues. You're not competing against each other. You're competing mm. versus, this. you all need to get over to the other side. So you could come together, five or 10 of you, and anyway, don't really quote me because they might say I'm encouraging brain pain, but it's okay. You you come together, five, 10 people, start studying for your SMLEs, your serious, start taking the exams, do preps, call folks who've done it. I, I'm happy to link you up. For example, my classmate Asha is now head of pathology in, somewhere in South Carolina. Wow. In the news hey, you got time. me in your class. What You people, you are charged. What was happening? Is it... Like for was the election violence? Yeah. What was going on? What's inspired uh, you? But it happens in every class. I think the class I had even did more. My class is a bit, uh, a few of us went. So you can talk to folks like Asha, who came here, did her USMLEs. I have George and Linda Colombia, a couple. One of them, they finished internship and they bounced immediately, like, boop, out. Okay. But George went before. George even finished internship. George left before internship ended. He did his USMLEs. They're now both cardiologists. They're doing their fellowship. 
they've done the specialization and then they're doing their subspecialty training together as cardiologists. Mm. There are a couple of folks. Yeah. So that's that's with studying abroad. Get a group, start reading, talk to people. The groups that I've done, I'm happy to link you up. There's a question around, uh, just to quickly answer, sorry, you have time. Yeah. Uh, around uh, Lesotho, how, how I ended up in Lesotho. I was actually just going to ask that. Yes, that's the second very, very question. Because yes. this goes back to network building and branding. So in Lesotho, I, I applied for a group called Chai. Actually, the first, I, I interviewed in Chai and the HR was Tanzania, was in Tanzania, but she's Kenyan. And she was amazing. I think she's called Anne. This is 2015, 2014. And Anne and I like, strike a good rapport. And she's amazing. And she's now taking care of me. She's like, watch it, you go in Kenya. So I'm like, hey, Anne, thank you very much. Always be kind. You're interviewed by HR, immediately, immediately email back, say thank you. You mail etiquette. Email back immediately. If you have a meeting, email it in. 24 hours, we have a request email within 24 hours back. And I email Anna, I'm like, thanks a lot for the opportunity. I think, anyway, maybe I did well. So I was interviewing for a job for Chai Swaziland, Swatini now, yeah, as a volunteer in the healthcare financing team. So I go through the interviews, I get the job. I get the job, funding dries up. I don't get the job, so they don't proceed with the job. And then they're like, ah, there's this other job in Swatini. Let's take you for that. So because I've already interviewed, I go for the last round of interviews. I do it, I pass. They're like, this is full-time associate healthcare financing. I'm waiting for papers. Eh, December, January comes, they're not communicating. They come back and say, oh, there's no money again. We can't take on you. And then Anne was like, Walter, you tried, you're really good. Let me try and link you up with Lesotho people. So she links me up with the hiring manager in Lesotho. Who we do the interview. She's called Ronki, she's Nigerian. And this is a very important point. So Ronki was a healthcare financing manager and she was looking for an associate. And I was competing with folks from Harvard. I remember Columbia oh. and Namimi, we are four. All of them are white, I'm the only black chap. But the most interesting thing is Ronki went to LSE, LSHTM, the university I went to. She went to London School of Economics, mm. London School of Medical Medicine. There's a dual degree called Healthcare Policy Planning Financing, HPPF, very famous. That's one you could do as well if you, if you oh. want to break the mafia. So <laughs> Ronki did, <laughs> Ronki did um, was there like two years before me, finished in 2012, I finished in 2014. She interviews me, she's like, okay, this app is good. She starts asking me questions directly around the program. What does this lecture I teach? What does this one do? And I'm like, yeah, I just tell her, I like this. I like minors, health economics, economic evaluations, you build this model, Nini. She hires me. And later on, she told me, Walter, you know, you're competing. This is so I learned about the people I was competing with. You're competing with very serious chaps, but I gave you a chance because I could understand your journey. I was, she's also a doctor. I was mm. like, you trying to break into this. I struggled a lot and I wanted to give back to, to, to you. And uh, she wasn't happy when I left, but it's like, uh, so she hired me, not, not nepotism, but she hired me because she could relate to my story. We mm. went to the same, we are from the same network, even if it was years apart. Very important point. Network. Uh, build your brand. We have how do you build your brand? <laughs> happy to happy to have a whole other discussion of building your brand. But don't worry, I'm happy to, to 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 spend more time talking. But it's just for you people, I feel bad ending before I finish talking. Uh, build your brand. There there are many tactics to building your brand. Maybe I'll just give you two three things. One, have your value system. What are your values so that you can build your brand around your values? So sit down tomorrow this weekend, write down five six things which you think are your values. Are you, for example, keen on service to humanity? Are you kind? Your values can also be like things which you maybe are not so good. Maybe you just like don't like people. You're an introvert and like, I don't want to work with people. I want to work with the dead. So you can be a pathologist. So, so that's something. So one, write your values. Two, try and build a brand around sort of what you aspire to do. And there are many ways to build a brand. One, mm -hmm. you can subject matter expert, even when you're still in med school. For example, you and Tusi are doing a good job organizing this. And I've had a chat with you people, how you can build your brand around this. Anybody else, for example, keen on public health, show up in all these public health conferences. Be there. I know you're a student, you don't have money, but just be there. They'll invite you for free lunch. That's what I used to do. I used to show up. Med reps, actually, you're going for you're in med school. Actually, they're having dinners after mini meetings. Actually, it's exclusive for physicians. Yeah, I'm showing up. I'm there. I'm sitting with them. Show up. Always show up. So always show up in what you want. And then three, Look for a way to put out the message that so that people know what you're about. So the platform I use, and you can use many platforms. The platform I use is LinkedIn. So I'm posting around leadership, I'm posting around investments, and people are starting to know uh, what, what I want. You could write 
on Facebook, you can write on Twitter, you can write on, you can have a newsletter. That's something people are doing. You can have a podcast. Podcasts are now big everywhere. Newsletters are big. You can write a bi-weekly newsletter, a weekly, every two weeks, around answering what you're doing, around med school, just sharing stuff. Build your brand around a community. You want to a series of how people become. Yes, I know. Yeah. So it's like, it's about picking a corner, or well, not necessarily a corner, but just being consistent with a couple of things, if it's one thing, and just yeah. making a, a presence with that kind of tool. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah always. Uh, always. Actually, and research has shown folks who sort of become like subject matter experts tend to really grow further in their career. I know sometimes there's divergent opinion on should you be a generalist or versus an expert. Mm. But you can be a generalist, you know many things, but if you're a subject matter expert, people will always look for you for that issue. So if it's something sure. that they really need, they'll always come to you. For example, if I need to get in touch with Amazon, I know there's you and Tusi. Like you're my people to talk to. I don't contact everybody else. If I need something in public health, you know you can talk to this. If you need something in finance, so you could always build your um, build yourself in whatever you're good at, and then you could work on the general stuff. Wow, the, the keys, guys! I got the keys, keys, keys. <laughs> I think I remember my students. What is he <laughs> doing here? <laughs> wow. Um. So I think we had said we'll do a a, a hard stop at nine thirty, but I think it's honestly so. It's first of all so amazing, like. Asha, Becky, Bongo, Cyrus, like Faith, everyone who has been here up until this time. It's really amazing. It's it's great to see the, I don't know, the hunger that we all jointly have for all of these things, um, even when they're being organized by Amsun, um, because this was even a brainchild of the chair, yours truly in Tusi. Um, and even the team has been working to organize them, G2, Ruby, and um, whether it's in person or it's online, and even to the speakers, and especially the audience, thank you so much for coming and even being an interactive audience and bringing up all the things which are here. Um, some, hey, there's some spicy questions coming in at the end. <laughs> okay. I leave that at the discretion of Dr. Mibe as I close up. Um, but I had really encouraged us to really think out loud here on this platform. And um, yeah, I really um, exhort or really um, ask each and everyone who has come, like for me, the three things I will take and that I was like, wow, I really ought to do this is to actually sit down. Even if it makes, even even it means making a mini treaties on like what I think about those controversial things. Cause hey, I tell you, there are already things in this very, I don't know if I should call it a sensitive world that are happening and you're just like, hey, if I was in that position, what would I do? And the fact that for you, your hack is to have a defined stance on that already. Mm -hmm. I think that, thank you so much for that, that you even write it. So I've even shared, shared that quote, right? The, a, a verse, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. So he may run who reads it. Because I'd also like to ask you, Dr. Bibe, is it, um, did you plan all of these things that you've seen panning out? Did you even have a mild construct or things have just been happening and unraveling based off of like that value system that you have? Hey, now you're asking the really good questions, which I don't even like talking too much about because let me tell you straight up, a lot of things I can never really explain and understand how they work. So I'm like, I'm a believer in God. Eh? So I usually say that's God working without just being at you, one of those people who just says for the sake of it. To give you a very good example, I applied to Stanford on deadline day, February 15th, 2022. My wife was asleep, I was downstairs, it was the, after my daughter's birthday. And I was struggling, I was feeling, I, I even didn't have money. I didn't have money to apply. I used my wife's card to pay for it, straight up. And I paid a lot of money, it's like 175 or 275 dollars. I was like, Quisha, to go broke. Now we're broke. We finished money on the birthday application. Half of February, we're waiting for. <laughs> and I get a call a month later. Oh, we want to interview you. I get an email. Do you know where I get the email where I was? To Likwa Mercury with Ted Peter Kimani at 2 a.m. What's up? 2 a.m. is like midday or 2 p.m. in Palo Alto or 3 p.m. in Palo Alto. I get an email. We want to interview you next week. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. shit. So I'm just telling you, like, it's pure luck. 
I get I do the interview the night before I'm going to for a conference in Ivory Coast. And I was panicking because I almost missed the interview because of two things. One, the time changed. It was March. Time usually changes. You see, now to see the reason we postponed the meeting because I had not thought of it. So I almost missed my interview because of that. And then two, 15 minutes before the interview was to start, internet disappears completely from everything, from phone, from, I couldn't get internet. So I'm like, shit. Uh, and then I joined late and I tell the, the admissions director, I'm sorry, man, internet, I joined 10 minutes late. We talk, we had a good interview. I got an admission letter end of April. I just laughed. <laughs> it's like I got to, well, actually, I tell you the, the, the fight of getting a visa, it was so hard. I was almost postponing. I almost deferred school. Uh, I got my visa. 10 days before class started mm. I got my 25th 26th june i bought my ticket the day i was traveling like third july ah. <laughs> like, got second the sequel yeah, because it was Qatar Airways. it's funny because of daylight and the time difference mm. you leave kenya one day and you arrive here at midday same day but i bought it the night the night before because i was like should i really go should i defer like everything has just been and a lot of instances in my life looking at getting the job in lesotho getting into london school london school had refused to go i was like i'm not paying this much money i'm not going anywhere it's too expensive i had a good life in his solo we were just living we were literally living the life as doctors circling i used to say it's the circle around the mountain we used to go Kerugoya. trust me i've been all those places nanyuki i do all the shimos isiolo meru embu we just used to go around living life but i left i always left at the right time um Another interesting part I didn't even share is when I was in primary school, I remember. I actually didn't go to class eight. I did KCP in class seven, and then I went from one. And I that was very pivotal because I ended up in Capsabet Boys, which I didn't even know was in school then. And then it turned out the way it did. And I have very good friends from Capsabet who've done really well, and we talk, and they help me out. And we, So it's just instances in life where you can't see, I don't know, just luck. We, it just be, they call it luck. You have to be really lucky as well. So sometimes, and and I'm and I'm very straight with this. I all these things happen not because that I was good. It's not because that I was I'm a genius. It's not because that I I figure this and the shit. No. There's a lot of it about uh, the hunger, just being hungry, always being there, always showing up, and luck. There's a lot of luck. So that's when now we say, okay, God, thank you. Because otherwise I'd not be here. I would, I would still be in Kenya. I would be in Jianze. And I, would, I, and I haven't even told you what happened in Jianze after I'll tell you. I left Johnson & Johnson in August. This is so sad, by the way. November last year, they fired half the team that I used to work with. Half. Home. And I told my wife, had I deferred this school, mm. and had we stayed on, we'd be jobless right now in Kenya, wondering how we're getting to Stanford. Mm. So, so, it's 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 and i know people will come and say oh i was a genius i was luck i thought of this i had this vision <laughs> yeah no vision i was just i said it's a marathon i'm just stumbling <laughs> of course i have like a long-term vision i'm like yeah we need to do this like now i'm thinking oh i need to open up investing in africa in the next five years mm. for good mentors i'm looking for good advisors i'm talking to folks and I'm, I'm like yeah but how it will pan out i have no idea i don't have a job for example i need i'm finishing in june I need to get a job within 60 days of finishing. I have no job lined up. And I'm like, shit, I need to get a job. I, oh, personal, I have, a, I, have a, I have a wife. I have a three-year-old daughter. She loves, they love this place. My wife is also a student. She's graduating next month at the University wow. of Cambridge. Cambridge? So, yeah, I'll be in UK for her graduation. Wow, so, I, I love how you just <laughs> like that in there. Yanni. No, but she's done well as well. No, I have to pause. <laughs> Because sometimes wow. you have to gas up your partner. And also, sometimes I think females in our setup in Kenya globally, they're not, they don't get the recognition that they deserve. Cheers. So she's finishing up Judge Business School uh, next month. So be there. So so go, you can do these things. So we are both career students. We are absolutely broke, deep in student debt, but we are together. We somehow have a plan. <laughs> And we will figure we'll figure it out as in and I'm happy to link you up with my friends. I, I hope they'll be as open to you. Like a lot of folks and, and your young doctors, straight up. It's not linear. People will pe people have gone through shit. Man. Like their dookies, you see your senior professors, they, they've gone through shit. Like there are people who you never we had a doctor who passed away, Dr. Kimende. You're not even in med school. He went through so many problems. Like, like it's 
life is like this eh? we don't talk about it and that's a and that's a sad thing i think we should be more open about this we should mm-hmm. talk about it so that you folks know that it's not straight it's yeah. not it's not that you see matiko he he got there by matiko matiko pia pitiad man matiko I went to live where Matiko used to live in London. We just went there. It was the cheapest place we could be as students. It was like three, three seventy, three ninety pounds. Mm. It was the cheapest place because we couldn't afford. We couldn't afford to where everybody else was living in downtown, paying a thousand pounds. We just we are Kenyans. We just realistic with our nini. You know, come say realistic. Oko, hey, manze mi si nado. Isi compete now. Say mi ni kuapa na jaribu ku do my best. Tuna ishi forty five minutes away from school. You should get my good friend Boni on this talk. Boni, Boniface Oyugi, I respect that chap. He's like my, he's my good friend and he's like a mentor, man. He works at WHO. Like, Boni, Boni Alikwa, like, anyway, he'll tell you a story. Like, he held my hand in London. He had a Commonwealth scholarship. So when I used to be broke, he used to give me cash. Like 20 pounds, 30 pounds. There's my good friend, George Mugomela in Tanzania. You should get him on board. He has a PhD, he works at CDC. He's now country director, acting country director. He's, he's Mugomela was in Cambridge doing his PhD. Like, he, he took care of me. They took care of us. Like they are good folks. I'll I can help you people meet the the good folks. I know you want mentors. So. The, the 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 tough thing. Oh, sorry to finish my rambling. The tough thing about being young is you actually don't know who might be a good mentor or not. Like you're trying to stumble and you're trying to find who's who, but they are good folks. I told him to say, and these people are hidden. Like the good ones. What made picture? Like you, you folks are in that group. No, no, they're makers. Oh, that thing. The good folks are just keeping quiet, and I usually know them, and they're just like. And I'm happy to guide you to to folks who who can who can make a good name. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you so much um, for uh, you really put so much heart in sharing your life with us um, and even addressing all of our questions as profusely as you have. Um, once again, this has been an African goodbye. I'm glad we're in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that one for we're standing up and you go to the door 10 minutes later the guy is on what like it's it's really been such a wonderful session uh maybe you can just have the comments just with appreciation for our speaker and so i'll just end by thanking again once again the amson committee for making this amson business forum possible and bringing to fruition um this oh actually i think i'll ask our chair and Tusi because he's here to give that vote of thanks um as we close up the session so Tusi, thank you uh thank you i really don't know where to start if if i'm to be honest um it's i think it's a challenge that we have as as young medical students in this country like there's a lot of hostility and it's like we aren't really guaranteed of where we can actually go and the things we can actually like aspire to do and even become. But I think you've told us something quite important, um, Walt. I mean, we are the smartest people in this country. And sometimes we underrate ourselves in the sense that we think of, as you said, you know, like the world class universities in this, um, like in this world as places you can't really reach. But you've showed us that we can. I mean, we just have to be bold enough to take the risk, as you said. Um, perhaps, you know, even use the Hustler Fund to, <laughs> to fund our studies there. I mean, it's just a matter of deciding and going with it. And I think there's also something quite profound um, that you shared. And it's the bit of connecting the dots, which is from Steve Jobs' um, impactful speech. It's like sometimes things might not be clear as we make these decisions but as time progresses and we think retrospectively it's like you know we actually understand how certain pivotal moments um played a role in our lives uh dr mibe i mean i can't um overemphasize we're quite thankful for the time that you've spent to speak with us you've also been open i mean you've opened up told us about family how you're trying to navigate life in all its spheres we don't take that for granted uh, Nyakio as well. Wow, you've done such a wonderful job with this. I mean, it's been quite an interactive session. And I'd also like to thank um, Endgame, uh, my team. Thank you for making this possible. The Amsun committee as well. I mean, planning this entire thing, G2 sending out thousands of emails <laughs> in, in three days. I mean, it's it's been a concerted effort. And also for all of us, it's a Saturday, it's a Saturday night. We might as well be doing um, a number of things. 
but you all decided to set aside this particular day, this particular time, and actually come and listen so that we learn, reflect, and plan our trajectories. Um, yeah, so without um, maybe being more verbose than, than I usually am, I'd just like to say thank you for your time. And Tusi, just to thank you as well, and thank you folks for, for having me. Uh, like, I don't take it for granted I get to, to speak to sort of the next generation of like leaders in the medical field. As I said, uh, feel free to reach out, happy to connect you to my friends who are doing this. Uh, like, I know so many amazing people who've, who've literally killed it, who are doing good things. They are quiet, they're hiding, but just say, just say it's me who referred you and will open the doors. Thank you, all the best. Oh, sorry, Walt, uh, we wanted to take like a, a selfie for posting. Yeah, I'm even offering, <laughs> if people are shy, I said, I'm going to say, I'll go get me next time. So what should really, I do? If they want to be made to feel better. <laughs> <laughs> um, would people be able to unmute? Oh, I, the video, yeah. we, I'm going to call hey, people I know by name. Louisa, Mikey, <laughs> Wenda, Francis. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, Elijah, welcome. Uh, I think I've been seeing Samantha, Bukonjia, interns, people out there already on the front lines. Are we, can we have some more people? Zotel. Interesting, yeah. Ruth, Ruby. Let's see. Mercy. Jabir. <laughs> Ian Kikonyo. Irene. I have a better uncle because I know if I find you guys up on streets, Pale Kwadin, Kitakua Nashida. And you. <laughs> Who's the current dean? Who's the present dean? Uh, no, it's, some it? of us are waiting for our results, so the, we've just been malingering up or outside waiting for them to be posted. So I know I'm okay. going to find these people. Who's um, the new dean? Pardon? Oh, the dean, um, C a CFO, Charles Frederick Otieno. Oh, he still is. As, yeah, he's a diabetologist. Yeah, associate yeah. dean, but yeah. the dean that we know. Um, okay, I think we can take the picture with the people so far. Do we have any other people out of the 68 as you only have, I think, 12? Well, it's, it's representative. It's not too bad. It's criteria for research. Um, okay, but thank you, Kamau. Thank you, Natich. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Mohammed. And yeah, I was just hoping for a full screen of participants. I think that's okay. Someone even has a picture of Albert Einstein. So, um, okay. Uh, everyone just smile. Uh, you can, what can we say? Who has something catchy to say? Uh, we stand, the man from Stanford. I don't know. Stan, I don't know. You can say, uh, I'm soon. Just say, I'm soon. I'm, it's okay. Some uh, people can say, I'm soon, other than later than that. So, when I say, I'm soon, just know I'm taking the screenshot. So, I'm soon. I'm soon. Uh, just another one for the road. Um, I'm soon. I'm soon. Perfect. Okay, then everyone is can feel free to leave. Thank you so much again. God bless you all. Have a lovely Saturday night. Good morning to you, Dr. Mbebe. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. I think people are still. Thank you. Folks. Really appreciate it. Huh? Asante Sana. Thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate it. You are thankful, man. Thank you for making the time. I don't have time today. I have actually I have an interesting lunch. Gosh, I wish you people come to these calls. I'm meeting um one of the co-founders of uh, have you heard of Andela? Yes. yes. They're, they're here. <laughs> oh. And there's a company called Flutterwave. Have you had a Flutterwave? Yes, before? yes, payment. It's like a fintech. Yeah. So the co-founder of both. So he started Andela, he left, and then went to Flutterwave, he left. He's called E. He's coming. He's in, he was in class wow. yesterday. We have his life. Tell them and to bring the back the, the Nini. It was, I think it was like a, there was like a scholarship kind of thing they had. Oh, really? Like, I love years it. Ago. Yeah, they used to mentor a lot of devs. So tell them to come back. He's uh, he's called so he left. He's not the current Flutterwave chap, but he's one of the one of the other chaps. Yes, really. 
Nice people, man. The Africans doing big things. Eh? That's why you people need to come out here and conquer. You see, Nigerians are aggressive, man. Like, they're like conquering. Mm-hmm. Egyptians are all over the place. So Kenya, see, to Kenya too. We were actually talking about this with our professor the other day. Mm. He's really fascinated how Kenyans just love Kenya so much. Like nobody wants to leave the country. Like people are happy. They invest in Kenya. They don't leave Kenya. Anyway, it's a good thing. Yes. Okay. Wait, I hope you're not holding people in informal chat. <laughs> I want to know the <laughs> No, Kenyans, they want to know. They want to know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah Kenyans have to know that we talked about. I think no, okay, I'll give you 60 it. seconds and I'll I'll <laughs> end this African goodbye for us all yeah, once yeah. and for all. So yeah, let me even stop recording. Yeah, stop recording. <laughs>